Hello, this is Gary Reinhardt from Declan Radio. I'm here with Virginia Allen, the 2021 American Honey Princess. And you guys can't see it. She's got her crown and sash on, so you know it is official. I am so glad to be here with you today. Well, cool. Thank you, Gary, for inviting me on. All right. So what exactly does it mean to be the American Honey Princess? I've never heard of this before. So I'm the national spokesperson for the American Beekeeping Federation, I, and I travel across the, you know, the country talking for, about honeybees and honey to all different types of listeners. Yeah. It must be kind of tough with, uh, I mean, restrictions just being opened up to having to travel like that across country. So you've probably had to do it more with the Zoom meeting and everything like that. Right. So at the beginning of the year, we were mainly restricted to the computer. And um, so we got all the kinks worked out with the virtual presentations. So we're still set up for that going into the fall, but we are starting to travel more as well. Um, our goal is to get all 50 states because beekeeping, bees and beekeepers are on all 50 states of the U.S. Wow. I, mean, I would expect that maybe something like north, like especially Alaska, there wouldn't, bees wouldn't be such a big part, but I guess they are. They are. Actually, up in Alaska, they have a really light fireweed honey, um, which it can be used as like a topping, but it can also come in... Um, the honey can come in a very dark color or flavor like buckwheat, mm -hmm. which has a very strong, bold flavor to it, which is great for glazes and um, other purposes as well. Yeah, and I know that, I believe it's today, this afternoon, you'll be at the Lake Pleasant Library uh, doing a presentation as well. So this afternoon, I'll be at the Adirondacks Experience um, talking about the, a little bit about the history of beekeeping and what consumers can do to get involved. But then tomorrow, Saturday, we'll be doing a, uh, a presentation right. over at the Lake Pleasant Library. Yeah. I don't know why I thought today was Saturday. <laughs> it's okay. I just want the weekend to be here, I guess. <laughs> but, yeah, it's very impressive. Um, so... I've heard a lot about the importance of bees to our just ecosystem and uh, how it, it helps not just flowers but plants. Maybe you can help dive a little more into that. Yeah, so honeybees help pollinate about the th one third of the food that we eat. So it's really vital that we have bees because um, without their pollination, we would lose about 80 different <coughs> crops. 80 different crops in the whole U.S. Uh, that ranges from our fruits and veggies um, all the way down to the, the different foods that the crops go into, like trail mix. Um, but honeybees pollinate directly almonds specifically um, that are over in California. And here in New York, you have apples. Now, I've heard, uh, I, I don't know if this is, in fact, maybe you can straighten this out. I've heard that almonds um, are detrimental to bees. Is that true? So almonds themselves are uh, great for honeybees. It can be a little tricky if you keep bees there too long because they don't have a diversity of food to choose from. Just like you might really like uh, your most favorite food, which could be ice cream or uh, steak and potatoes. If you were to eat your favorite food for uh, an extended period of time, it would kind of lose its flavor and you wouldn't be very healthy. So uh, floral varieties are the spice of life to honeybees. So they need a variety of food in order to be healthy. So it sounds like it'd be tough to try to have like a bee farm. Like, you know how you have cow farms, chicken farms, and that. but because it sounds like you need a lot of diversity, it sounds like having a bee farm would be a very difficult and surmountable task. Well, it's kind of interesting because while the majority of beekeepers are commercial, um, Rather, while well, the majority of the impact of bees and bees and bee pollination come from the commercial beekeepers, um, there are quite a few hobbyist beekeepers that live in cities. And the dynamics are quite interesting because out in the country you have a lot of the same kind of flower, whereas in the city you have uh, a lot of different kind of flowers. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm hoping this part is true, or I've been scammed out of a lot of money. Uh, we have a farmer's market. It just wrapped up this week. Um, every year I buy local honey 
uh, usually a big jar because I've been told it helps with allergies, especially raw honey. Please tell me that it's true. <laughs> Some people have found benefit of eating local honey to help with allergies, mainly because it has a little bit of pollen in there. Um, and it also helps to build up your immunity against uh, the pollens that you're allergic to. Uh, again, everybody is different and they're going to react a little differently. So always check with your doctor before you, before you try something new. Well, at least I can say it tastes really good with my tea in the morning. <laughs> that it does. <laughs> You know, and it's nice to be helping out local beekeepers and people who sell honey. And that's what the farm market does is a lot of local businesses. So I always feel good helping them out too. Oh yeah. Definitely. If you put your money into the community, that helps a beekeeper to continue doing their work and caring for the bees. And uh, that's really helpful uh, because uh, beekeeping, beekeeping is... Um, a very hands-on hobby for a commercial job um, and it takes a lot of work in order to maintain the bees. Alright, now I'm reading through this uh, fact list here. One thing sticks out to me. My uh, father and, my grand and his family were actually dairy farmers and uh, according to the bee facts here, honeybees benefit the dairy industry by pollinating alfalfa and clover necessary as livestock feed. I didn't know that they help out industries such as that as well. They do, and through their work of pollination, they put in touch the, the plates of every single person. Um, they pollinate the alfalfa, which then the dairy cows can eat. That alfalfa it can also give um, nutrition into the ground and help the corn grow better. Um, it's a little bit of like a puzzle piece because uh, there's a lot of different things going into our food and into the nature, um, but I mean, even from just a, a beauty standpoint, honeybees, by pollinating flowers, produce more flowers, and then they're just gorgeous to look at and smell. Yeah. Uh, I have kind of a love-hate relationship with flowers, especially with, as I had mentioned, my I have really bad allergies, but I do love to see them, and I do love to see the bright colors come out of, of flowers. Uh, as many people... Uh, think of bees they think of the thing on the end of the bees as you know the most <laughs> the little stingers there do you think that gives bees a bad rap um, because of that well honeybees only sting out of defense so if they feel like themselves or their colony is being threatened then they're they're willing to uh, die to protect that uh, a honeybee can only sting one time because she has a barbed stinger. So when that stinger sticks into your finger and she flies away, um, then that there's an organ that's actually taken out of the bee. So she dies because of that. Um, but all you need to do is just take your fingernail and scratch out the stinger. That's all you need to do. If you press on that little venom sac, that's going to force all that venom into you and you're going to have a worse reaction. Mm -hmm. So just remember, take your fingernail, scratch out the stinger, and that's it. Yeah. Now, you were talking about beekeeping as a hobby, and it sounds, it, it feels to me like the equivalent of bungee jumping. It sounds like, to me, a very, uh, I wouldn't say risky hobby, but it's definitely <laughs> a hobby to me that'd be out there. Maybe you can uh, yeah. educate me on that. <laughs> so beekeeping is not for everybody, but the majority of beekeepers are hobbyists. So that means they only have about one to two hives. Um, and sometimes it's just to get enough honey for them and their family um, or just give away as gifts. There's about 300 different varieties of honey here in the U.S. and they all come from the different nectars of the flowers. Mm -hmm. Now how many bees can live in one hive? There's about 60 to uh, 80,000 bees in one colony in the peak of the summer. Yeah, that definitely would scare me. <laughs> <laughs> now, what equipment would most beekeepers have? Maybe aspiring beekeepers who are listening in can start kind of saving money up for so generally, it, it uh, you got to think about the startup costs. So you have like the bees, um, the equipment that in themselves, 
the uh, protective equipment and of course lessons so that you know what you're getting into before you even get the fees. Mm -hmm. um, so all of that can kind of add up, but generally you're looking to about 500 to a thousand dollars depending on where you get your equipment and lessons from. Mm -hmm. um, if you're interested in starting beekeeping, check out the, uh, the New York State Beekeepers and they can give you area specific inf information. Um, and that's really helpful because beekeeping varies quite a bit throughout the U.S. Yeah, and we'll put that up uh, under our video, the, the link to that. So how did you get into beekeeping and being the American Honey Bee Princess? So I started about eight years ago through a youth scholarship program, um, and I just did it as a way to get to know my dad, and we grew into a small family business. Um, but through our years of beekeeping, we've kind of found um, that I absolutely love talking about honeybees and honey. So uh, I became the American Honey Princess based on my knowledge of the industry and also my communication skills. Now, is there... To, is there like a contest for this or is this something you just send in for? How, how, is, how do you exactly become American Honey Bee Princess? So the, uh, you interview just like you would for any other job and um, they have, basically they just want you to be good with people and be able to speak knowledgeably and clearly to a wide variety of ages. Um, we speak to kindergarten all the way up through uh, uh, seniors and you can, yeah, everybody's interested in bees and honey, so we, we're, we're trained to talk to everybody. <laughs> this is uh, weird in fact, like you're actually not the first royalty I've met. My cousin down in Skahari is the New York Dairy Princess mm -hmm. and went to, did sort of the same thing. She's uh, much younger. Uh, she, I believe she's only like 15, 16, but uh, she was able to win the award at the New York State Fairgrounds. And because of COVID, her reign has lasted longer right. than uh, usual. And I told her, I'm like, don't let that go to your head when they try to take the crown off you. But yeah, it's really important that, that people understand where their food comes from, and that's why they have uh, different royalties. Um, and especially with my job as, the, as a honey promoter, is I talk about the different uses of honey, and that honey comes in different uh, tastes and textures. Yeah. Now, uh, we have a lot of bright flowers in the Adirondacks, which is one of the reasons I love being here. Just nature is amazing in itself. How does a bee uh, fit in all that? Like, what is the process from, I guess, hive to hive? Like, you go from the hive to flowers and you go back to the hive to make the honey. So, when a worker bee gets a little bit older, <laughs> for honey bee terms, uh, a worker bee usually lives about four to six weeks in the summertime. Um, so that's the that's the peak season for them. There's tons of flowers out there. So when the bee uh, goes throughout all of her other jobs, um, then foraging is actually one of the last things that she does. So she will uh, leave the hive. She'll go out and pollinate all of the apple flowers that she can. She'll bring back the pollen and the nectar. And the pollen they'll eat as protein, just like you and I might eat our meats and, and tofu. Um, we The bees will eat their pollen. Um, and then with the nectar, then they'll dehydrate that into honey, and then that will be their carbohydrate resource. So they need both to live, and uh, they can find both of those uh, products from trees, vines, uh, bushes, even ground cover. Now, how do we as extract the honey from the honeycomb? Like, I've seen TV shows and commercials. This is the now famous commercial of I think it's for State Farm, where, <laughs> yeah. where the adjusters in is in the full thing, and then they make jokes. Do you want to meet the queen? He's like, No, no, I'm not dressed for that. <laughs> that always makes me laugh. How do you, uh, people extract the honey from the honeycombs? Well, first up, um, we'll put on our our uh, protection, and that's just mainly to keep the bees away from our face. Um, since we are going into our hive, there's a little more chance that we, we w might get stung. Um, so we just put on protection first, and then when we go through it, um, we the, the bees have already built out all the wax by eating honey. And then they fill that wax comb with honey, and then they'll cap it with a 
thin little layer of wax on top. So similar like you have um, canned goods in your pantry, that's kind of the bees canned goods. So when we take out that frame of those snow white cappings, then we'll um, just take a hot knife and uh, just cut those cappings off. Mm -hmm. We'll put it in a large centrifuge, which works kind of like a washing machine where uh, it has a basin that spins around and around. And then through that process, once you, put, once you put the frames in the basin, then that will rotate and that will sling all the honey out against the sides. Mm -hmm. That will uh, dribble down to the ends and um, at the bottom of that basin, Carrie, this is my favorite part, mm -hmm. there's a little gate and you can open that up and all of the wax, all of the honey can come straight out. Oh, that sounds really good. I know. I think I, I put my pancakes right under it. And <laughs> put the honey right I did on that top. this morning. <laughs> oh, that sounds so good. Now on your sheet here, it says here one honeybee makes one twelfth of a teaspoon of honey in their in her entire lifetime. I I always imagine that It'd be a lot more than that. That does not sound like a lot of honey in a lifetime. Yeah, realistically, it's about a drop. So if you're trying to measure, yeah, about a twelfth of a teaspoon. So the little honey sticks that you see at the farmer's market all the time, um, those have about a tablespoon of honey in them. So it's about the life work of 36 bees. Yeah, I'm right now I'm holding a uh, like a plastic straw. It, this is, it basically looks like... Uh, one of those uh, sugar straws that, that you ha have as a kid, if, if for reference for those on the radio who can't see what I'm holding. Or it, it looks like just the size of a regular straw you would have at uh, a restaurant or so. I mean, that, and that's what you said, 36 bees? Yeah. Yep. So it's just a plastic straw you can bite on the end and that'll um, open up the straw for you to, to slurp out the honey. Um, and all of that goes through, through teamwork because when the honeybees are storing that honey, they're not necessarily storing that for themselves because they're towards the end of their life already. So that's one way that they can give um, and prepare for the next generation of bees. And also since they produce so much more honey than they could ever eat for themselves, um, then we can harvest it and use it for our uses. Now I notice you say her in your honeybee fence. Are females the ones that are out doing all this work? Mm -hmm. So there's three main bees in the hive. Uh, there's the, the queen, the drone, and the worker. So the drones are the males. Um, their job is just to mate with the queen and then sadly they die. Um, but then the queen and the worker, they're both females. So there's only ever one queen, but the majority of that colony is all the females and those are all workers. Um, they do different jobs uh, depending on how old they are, um, such as cleaning out the hive, they'll, um, they'll just take out all the trash, they'll turn around when they first get there, uh, first arrive as bees or emerge, then they'll turn around and uh, clean out their cocoon, they'll take any uh, dead bees that might have died inside of the hive outside so that way it keeps it nice and clean. Um, next they'll go and um, help the mom and or the the queen of the hive and just feed and groom her because the queen is so busy uh, all day laying about 2,000 eggs a day and that's her only job. <laughs> yeah. And I, th I thought my grandmother with seven kids was, was tough. <laughs> so what is the uh, lifespan of a honeybee? Like how long do they live? So it kind of depends on what bee it is. So the worker bees live about four to six weeks in the summertime. Um, in the winter, they can live a couple more weeks, but no longer than really 12. Um, and then the drones, they are mainly produced in the spring. And then if they haven't mated by the end of summer, they usually get kicked out of the hive um, by fall because they're just consuming so many resources. Um, and that by that time, then the flowers are getting more scarce. So then um, the queen, she lives about two to three years because she's a fed a different diet. That is, it's always weird to think when animals, even like insects, which you would think might not have like a higher brain function, have like a hierarchy system and can tell, hey, this guy's not pulling his weight. we got to get him <laughs> out of here. And that, that's always been interesting to me when, when you think of animals in that aspect. 
especially right. compared to like us humans. Right. Well, each bee has uh, different features that help them to do their job. The queen has a longer abdomen, which allows her to put the eggs down at the very bottom of the cell so that they can grow correctly. Um, the drone, the, he has some really big uh, compound eyes, which allow her him to see the queen in flight and mate with her. And then um, he also doesn't have a stinger, so he can't really help defend the hive. So they rely on the worker bees to do that. Um, in addition, the worker bee has hair all over her, even on her eyeballs, that help her to um, pollinate the different crops. Now, when a queen dies, do they select a new queen, or well, like what happens when that when that goes on? So the only difference uh, between the queen and the worker is what they're fed. So um, they come from the same fertilized egg, and all eggs are fed royal jelly, which is the high protein substance um, that's basically like a high protein shake for the bees. It allows the queen to develop fully, and it also gets the other eggs just a quick jump start to their uh, development. So after those three days, the queen will be kept on the royal jelly diet for her entire life, all throughout development and into her adult years, or days, <laughs> and then the, um, the, you know, the worker bees will be fed a mixture of pollen and, uh, and nectar, which we call bee bread. So that kind of just is the standard diet for most bees. <laughs> yeah, and that's different from the honey that we consume. So the bees will eat honey and pollen for their own uh, food. But where we get the honey is because they produce so much honey. Um, an average pound, uh, an average hive in this area of New York can produce about 40 to 50 pounds a year. So, so we're not harming the bees in any way by collecting the honey from them. Not at all. Honeybees produce so much honey that um, they that we can harvest it um, without harming them. Um, plus, with managed bees, we can also monitor them if their resources do get low, and we can feed them supplemental food to help them through the winter. Well, we've been talking about honeybees, uh, and I know this might be a little outside of your zone. How many other types of bees are there? <laughs> Would you happen to know? I don't have an exact number because there's a lot of other bees. There's a lot of native bees, and there's a lot of uh, imported, but mainly we use honey bees because of their use in crop pollination. So commercial mm -hmm. beekeepers, which have thousands of hives, they will load their hives up every spring onto a, a semi-truck, and then they will um, transport those across the coast and just pollinate crops as they go along. No. Do they have an estimation of how many honeybees live in just the United States? <laughs> or is it just a, an astronomical number that we can't even fathom? <laughs> oh, I don't know about an exact number on the highs, but I know that as of 2019, uh, beekeeping is worth about $15 billion to the U.S. agriculture. All right. I think I know <laughs> how to fix the budget. I mean, we need some more bees. <laughs> Uh, I mean, I've heard that honeybees are going, I wouldn't say extinct, but are definitely on a downturn because of whether it's urbanization or, you know, various um, maybe pesticides and stuff like that. Are honeybees suffering at the moment or are we, are we still, still good? Are we still uh, on a good level? So honeybees um, are struggling because there's a lot of different things that uh, compound on the bees all at the same time. But thankfully, because of beekeeper and farmer collaboration, we're able to find out what the things are and how consumers can help. So one of the best things that you can do is in the springtime when those first flowers come out, um, even if they're wildflowers like dandelions, just leave those in your yard for a couple weeks and that can help the bees to get those early resources and to uh, start jump-starting their development in the hive. Yeah. If a honeybee makes a hive near my home, you know, and I'm afraid it's gonna, they're going to sting my family and my pets and whatnot, what is the proper way to uh, deal with that? 
So most hives are just looking for a home and they'll just kind of mind their own business. Now if you do, uh, if you would like them removed, just contact your local beekeepers. Uh, you can again check out the New York beekeepers and um, you contact somebody on their list and they can um, and they can come out and remove or at least help you um, decide on what to do for that. Yeah, because I know like my brother is highly allergic to bees. So if he is the venom, as you stated earlier, if the venom sac were to go into his bloodstream, we'd have to use an EpiPen and get him to the hospital right away. So I know that bees and wasps and things like that do make people kind of nervous, especially well, if it's near their house. Right. So while anaphylaxis is a a reaction that people can get not everybody reacts in the same way so mm -hmm. some it's just a little more than a, a little itchy for a couple days and it swells up kind of quick but usually it subsides pretty quick mm -hmm. um, but yes for some other people you need uh, to keep an EpiPen on you mm -hmm. um, but always just if you have any concerns about it or um, or if you want some more information just always check with your doctor um, to before you go into beekeeping or into nature where, you, where there's probably wild bees around. Mm. Let's see, I'm taking a look at your bee facts. Oh, this one's interesting. To make one pound of honey in eight days, you need 1,100 honeybees that fly 55,000 miles visiting two million flowers. Now, when you see numbers like that, it's hard to just compute in your head just... <laughs> how much that is like I can't even imagine what two million flowers look like <laughs> let alone when a bee pollinates from one flower is that flower now I don't want to say useless because of course it has many other things but like can it be reused by like another bee or is that it so each, each flower has different requirements for pollination. So many flowers need to be uh, pollinated or uh, have a lot of pollen transported to that one flower. So it needs to be visited multiple times. Um, generally, the flower produces the nectar as a sweet uh, incentive to pollinators to come to them. So once that flower has enough uh, pollen, then it will just start to uh, start the next phase of actually producing the fruit, whether that be producing another arm to produce more flowers or actually producing like food, like an apple or something. Um, but honeybees will, will just travel from flower to flower and then um, that can help to, to help pollinate. Now, when I buy raw honey at the um, farmer's market, it, it's more of like a almost like a butter because you like scoop it out and stuff and it's like a hard I guess almost like a wax but I don't want to like mix terms up by accidentally but it's definitely more like a butter and I've put it on like uh, in my English muffins and in my tea and stuff but that is leagues different at least to, to my amateur eyes than like what you buy at the store which is like that golden honey that you can drizzle on to things. What's the difference between like the, the honey I buy at the farmer's market and honey I buy at a store? Well, from taste to texture, honey can really surprise you. So the uh, difference is basically it all comes from the natural uh, liquid honey. And um, so liquid honey is one flavor. It's very smooth. You can use it easily in your cooking. Um, you can also use it as a skin or maybe a hair mask. But you can also um, allow it to crystallize. If it does it naturally by itself, just by being cold, um, that has, produces a very large chunky crystal. And while some people kind of like to chew on that, some others like a more smooth, buttery kind of flavor, like you mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, so what they do to produce that is they have a um, they have a cedar seed starter mix of um, just very very fine smooth crystals, and then they'll put that into a bucket of liquid honey, and that helps it to controlled and just control the process of crystallization. So then all of that honey will then crystallize around those small, tiny crystals. And while they stir it a little bit, that helps it to get that more consistent a texture of the creamed or, or spun honey. Now, I, uh, I need you to help me with a, a argument I ha once had with a coworker. Because like I said, I like to use raw honey and I think it helps. But 
we have at one of our local restaurants a jar of honey, and it doesn't get used that often. And I had a coworker tell me, oh, I think that honey went bad. And I said, honey doesn't go bad. Is that true? Is yeah, it? honey never goes bad. So uh, if, your, if your jar gets uh, crystallized or that nice hard texture, um, if it's in a glass jar, all you need to do is put it in a pot of warm water. Um, you can bring your pot of water up to a simmer, turn off the heat, put the jar of honey in there, and that will help it to slowly warm up and reliquify. All right, so score one for Gary. <laughs> So I see here on your list, you've got commercial beekeepers transport beehives from coast to coast, providing pollination services for a wide range of crops. Now that to me seems interesting because, especially in the Adirondacks, we live under the, the, the thumb or the rule that we try to keep things where they're supposed to be. So to think like, oh, you're transporting it from coast to coast, that seems kind of foreign to me. So while there are a lot of things for honeybees to pollinate in the area where they're at, um, in order to produce that large reach of pollinating 80 different crops, um, we do have to move the, the hives because they only the honeybees only fly about two to three miles away from their, their current location. So if we're able to move the hives, um, that will help expand their reach. I've actually never really seen beekeepers like in their natural habitat, like we're 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 a big uh, syrup place. I mean, we have especially starting soon. We're going to have a lot of people selling syrups and apples and things like that. So those are big industries here in the Adirondacks. But I've never really seen beekeeping. So uh, I didn't know if it was a huge thing in New York or not. Sometimes it's just a, an awareness thing where once people start realizing and, and once they hear programs like this where they're hearing about bees and learning about their impact, then they start actually seeing bees on the flowers back home um, where maybe they just walked by the bush and they just never even noticed it. Um, but that's one of the really important jobs that I like to do is just just show people new things about bees, get them excited about it, and then um, you, and then they can they can take it from there, and they can uh, just plant flowers for bees, use honey. Honey is is a different sweetener than maple syrup or sugar. Um, they all have their benefits, but honey can be used for a lot of other things as well. So bees use like a whole range of flowers, like so just just planting flowers would be helpful enough. Like yes. you don't have to be like, oh, I gotta plant lilacs or I gotta plant. If you can plant native wildflower mixes, that can help the bees because your flowers are going to be more sustainable and it gives the bees that diversity of food that they need. So that way they can um, have like a super Walmart full of food and, um, and that way it's not just an, an okay taco truck on the side of the road. Are there, is there anything else you'd like to talk about before we start wrapping up about um, what you do or maybe something we missed about bees that you find is important? Well, comb honey is an excellent honey that uh, is just exactly the way the bees have made it. Um, all that is done to harvest that crop is we just take a knife, then cut out the, the comb. And instead of removing the cappings, we just put that whole chunk of comb inside a container for consumers. So you can chew on the wax, that can help to clean your teeth, and it's a great special treat if you find it from a local beekeeper. So always put your money back into your community and um, just plant flowers for the bees. That's one of the best things you can do. Excellent, excellent. Um, so I see there are various links at the bottom of your, your sheet. We'll put those in the video for this. And um, so if you would like to meet the... Uh, American Honey Bee Princess. She will be at the library, the Lit Pleasant Public Library tomorrow, and that's at 1 p.m.? Yes. Yes, yes. yes that would be 1 p.m. So I'm very glad to have met you. I'm very glad to have sat down and be able to get this interview with you, and good luck on everything in your future endeavors. Awesome. Thank you so much, Gary. All right. Take care.